Pete. Um, so I'm going to be talking about um, paleolithic groups uh, in Northern England in the Vale of Pickering. Uh, how do you get this to Right, so the Vale of Pickering is obviously known for its early Mesolithic um, archaeology being the site of the location of Stone Car. There's also a number of other um, Paleolithic um, uh, sites in the Vale. Um, we've got uh, a hint of famous Mesolithic occupation at um, the site of Stephen Kay and what seems to be more ex uh, extensive uh, long day occupation at Cena C, Cena uh, L, and uh, Flixton too. Um, so particularly in terms of the long grade material, this sort of more extensive archaeology um, allows us to think a bit about uh, what sort of uh, location people are selecting for occupation, um, and also a bit about how these sites tessellate in the border landscape, so in terms of border patterns of uh, mobility and uh, material procurement. So here is uh, the Bay Pickering and Lake Flixton. Uh, Paleolithic Flixton. So we have a number of sites uh, around uh, Lake Flixton. We have one um, uh, Fader Mesa site at Super K, possibly some Fader Mesa ephemeral occupation at Super C, and a number of um, uh, these long lay sites uh, around uh, Super C. Um, in terms of sort of thinking about uh, what uh, locations people were selecting in this landscape for occupation. Um, we've got sort of very uh, particular type of uh, archaeology uh, around, uh, around Lake Flixton. So the work I'm talking about is based very much on the excavations of, of Tim Chandler Hall, um, who uh, initially worked in the Seamere area here from um, 1975, um, and then Tesco took around the of Lake Flixton and islands in, in, in the middle of the lake. Um, there's much more extensive excavations in the Seymour area because this would be able to become a waste disposal area. And it's probably no coincidence that here we get um, all these, uh, uh, as well as Mesolithic, um, final and uh, terminal uh, Paleolithic sites. Um, then it's after sort of uh, Tim. Uh, dug at the 24 and a half metre contour around the lake. And after that didn't really sort of pick up um, uh, sort of uh, Paleolithic sites, so we found a lot more Mesolithic sites. His sampling strategy really uh, aimed to locate any Mesolithic sites. And certainly if we look at um, the heights of uh, some of these uh, uh, long lake sites, in particular they seem to be slightly higher in, in this landscape at the 25 metre contour. And we know from sort of extensive work on the Mesolithic material that the location of sites is really quite a complex relationship between sort of lake levels um, and what people, uh, which fluctuate over time, and also what people uh, are doing in the landscape at this time. So we have offshore deposition with the, um, some of the Mesolithic sites that sort of the 23 and a half, 23 metre contour, where we get sort of living occupation around 23 and a half metres. And, 25 metres. So probably people are, sort of, uh, the Long Bay groups are sort of living on the sort of, uh, inhabiting these sort of drier land areas and um, we're not sort of picking up the sort of very lake edge activity which may be to do with, with these lake levels. So briefly to talk about the Fader Mesa material, um, there may be a hint of uh, uh, occupation at sea and sea, where there are some projectile points that might belong to the long way, might belong to the uh, fader mesa uh, groups. Um, but more extensive occupation is found at Sema K, where we have a mixed site which has both very mesolithic and fader mesa material. Um, work on the scatter shows that these ones encircled in red are mostly uh, fader mesa. Um, and occupation, um, occupation sort of very much focused on um, lots of scrapers, a uh, lot of you in some projectile points. In some parts of the site, the fade less material can be found um, in this sort of lower um, peak level, uh, which uh, is separated from the only less material 
uh, by a um, young journalist cover sound. Uh, we have we have dents of this uh, regulation to schedule uh, uh, peat. Um, but in many of areas of the site, this isn't present, and it's quite extensively disturbed by uh, by tree throws in the central part of the site. So it seems a very reasonably substantial occupation, uh, people making lots of tools. Um, we also have a lot of uh, projectile points as well, um, pen knife points, uh, straight and curved back points. Um, some really nice work done by um, Andrew David and Francis Van Smith did really well at uh, fitting some of these projectile points back into uh, refit sequences. So, this is a little uh, curve back point that fits into a, uh, a sequence using world's raw material. And this seems part of a broader pattern of this site. Um, people are coming to the site with mainly with tools um, that's made out of what looks quite like tool material, um, very speckled stuff. Um, but they're made mainly based on the sort of uh, famous mapping occupation. The site is happening on the world's material. So they're probably showing it quite light with many tools, probably coming from a reasonably distant source, and we're re retooling with the local uh, Yorkshire world's not very nice uh, quality uh, uh, flint. So they're doing quite sort of uh, typical sort of photolesser type things, um, really using quite local materials uh, in, in quite a sort of flexible way. It's not the most uh, beautiful uh, mapping sequences, quite big, sturdy, um, Platforms, they're using tabular material and cortical platforms quite a lot. So we've got a bit of evidence of, what, uh, of the final paleophic occupation, but if we move on to a long, uh, terminal material, a long blade occupation, I call it long blade um, because that's uh, what we've been calling the British material, but it, given its sort of location, um, it uh, might be an uh, increasing fines of um, perfect material in Scotland, it may be an Arnsbergian more appropriate term. So we have a number of sites um, which have both form material and napping. The biggest of these is Cena C, which is just here. Um, this is again another mixed site, so we have a number of um, uh, a number of Mesolithic and um, long blade scatters. Um, I've done lots of refitting work on these scatters, and this means scatters C and F and uh, to less extent part of scatter B belong to this long blade occupation, the remainder of the materials Mesolithic. So in terms of this sort of northern long blade material, it has quite a few uh, many of the characteristics of the southern long blade material. It's on slightly smaller packages of raw material. So we have blades exceeding 12 centimetres, but not up not so that's small compared to some of the southern sites like Bingham, for example. We do have bruise elements. Um, this little lapping sequence here is not a refitting bruise ball. Use of a soft hammer, possibly a soft stone hammer. And it's very, it differs very much from the sort of early Mesolithic um, material. Uh, it's people um, are using uh, sort of cores of bilateral press. <coughs> The back of the core is either cortical or it has remnant of the crest. Um, the, the material is faceted, um, quite a big uh, platform of course, compared with a, a big less of a thick uh, material. Um, very neat abrasion. Um, in contrast to, quite, uh, to many of the southern sites, um, burnt flint and uh, indeed tools are common, um, particularly in Scatter C. And here we have a nice total selection. Um, as it's a mixed site, it's slightly difficult to tell the projectile points from the um, Mesolithic stuff. But we see, certainly in terms of the clustering, we seem to have um, maybe fronted points, uh, nice little um, back bloodlets um, for it going with uh, the long way material. We've also got a lot of other tools from scrapers, and particularly urines, they seem to be very fond of uh, particularly elaborate urines, as you can see here, which often made on imported blades, such as this one, the one that on the site, uh, and have these elaborate urines here that sort of reworked and um, resharpened and, and worn down, um, uh, and bruised uh, and rug end pieces as well, a kind of feature of the site. Um, here's a picture of the tools, uh, around this broadly sort of more urines in the north uh, and um, sort in the south. Um, this, this is a little cluster of burnt fluid that's likely to indicate a half. 
Moving on to scatter F, it's a, it's a sort of smaller scatter, um, sort of like more classic long blade, and there's not many uh, tools. Uh, we've got a couple of cuts, fragments, and um, a scrape and a <coughs> um, We also have a nice number of refits uh, for the maximum of the material. Um, and these sort of give us a bit of an understanding of how people are using the space of the site. So around this half at Scatter C, um, we have two sort of napping clusters, two called napping stations. Um, this one here, people are reducing um, three um, partly prepared cores, blades are missing from the sequence. Um, here, they're decortifying big tabular modules and the cores aren't, aren't found. Some quite interesting patterns in that this, uh, this is another module or two that have been um, partly napped here and partly napped here. Um, which sort of show connections between these two areas of the site. And these blades are, are segmented intentionally and seem to be sort of used in different areas of the site. We've got different, we seem to have different segments being brought in different places, but also whole blades being transported between the two. Uh, Scatter F, this nice little mapping sequence, just a one partly prepared uh, core. Um, we can't, it's difficult to tell whether this is contemporary with the scatter, with the scatter C, but there's a little, the little um, tip of this uh, microlith is found sort of five metres away from scatter F, and the, and the tail of this is uh, found in scatter C. So there, there may, be some, may be some connection. Some formula from this site, most of it belongs to the mesolithic occupation. Um, and most of the stuff with the, the long bit scatters are, are, is unidentified, but you can see the green is a uh, horse. Um, so, definite horse and scatter F on margin of scatter C. Um, I suspect a lot of this unidentified material like a horse, and another little horse scatter coming up, which may be a little butchery area associated with the site. Um, there's another little long bow scatter at, at SEMA L, which is just a reduction of a couple of little, little cores. Um, a lot of the materials that gives us indication of this is a landscape that we're using more broadly um, comes from uh, horse remains. Roger Jacobi um, noted that um, uh, butchery of, of horse or smashing the marrow caused certain damage to horse teeth, and he particularly selected these humanly modified horse teeth for dating. So a lot of this work comes from uh, Roger and uh, Tom's dating program. And these suggest that they're also they people sort of lurking here in, in the area between uh, C and K. Um, and also uh, at Barry's, Barry's Island. There's also a somewhat modified horse here, um, and also an isolated viewer in here, which suggests people are long way people more broadly around this lake. But to understand Hunting practice is a bit more, we need to move to uh, Flixton Island. Uh, Flixton 2 in particular, this was excavated by John Moore in 1948 and 1949. Um, his report in, in Clark's Star Volume suggests he found uh, three horses. It sounds like he did a bit more work uh, later on, and there's a report in uh, Scott Williams who suggests he got a three uh, six horses. He didn't find very much flint, only little shoulder point and little bladelet. Um, Tintler Hall undertook some more excavations in this area and again didn't find the flint book further remains of course were located and we've got uh, some new excavations by Nikki and Carla uh, Taylor, which Nikki's very kind of like to uh, briefly talk about. Um, so the new excavations uh, just at this area at the top. Um, and here we have um, we have a uh, lake edge to try from at the base, um, covered with quite a thick layer of, of sand. So there's been debates um, uh, whether this is waterborne or, or windblown. And I think it suggests it's, um, it seems to be material that um, is coming being washed down the island, um, probably in a little early Holocene uh, cold snap. Possibly if it's not very fully vegetated, the landscape's quite unstable, so it's, um, uh, it's affected by these fairly uh, levels, it's not such as the proof of insulation. So I think that's some of the isotope work 
um, done by um, the Royal Holloway team and some Bloxley and colleagues as part of Nikki's ERC project has, has suggested these um, policy effects are quite important. So the horse remains our only really sort of mirror uh, to try to put mud. Um, and here we see from Nikki's excavations, we can find more and more uh, horse remains, um, a few other animals as well, potentially such as the uh, red deer. Um, but lots of this horse material is in partial articulation. It's been kept in processes by humans, um, cut marks and, and marrow smashing. Um, but again, not very much lithics associated with this. Um, just one large blade, which um, any of them might go and show us have got butchery evidence. So what we seem to have is a real quite large scale um, horse hunting episode or episodes um, where people are has seems to happen in the long amongst the long groups, give a kind of food with them, um, and they're using quite spare sparse and they don't uh, drop much from demonstrating the butchery activities. Um, Felix is obviously an island, but the work by the Royal Holloway team suggests maybe at the end of the young dress the lake level's a bit lower, so maybe it may just have been a, a peninsula where people could use sort of natural topography to disadvantage uh, herds of horse. Um, some radiocarbon dates, uh, this is particularly from uh, Roger and Tom's work, um, particularly again drawing on the work of Laura, Laura Kagan as well. Um, there's been historically there's been a big problem with the Flixton Monday dates. Um, uh, Marrow and High and Paper suggests that um, the hydroxy, proline, and iron exchange pre treatment work methods work best because it's heavily contaminated by uh, humic acid. Um, so based on Roger and Tom's work, this is probably the ballpark for the Flixton but, uh, horse, but we're doing new work with Alex Davis, which may well uh, change this, which might suggest there's a, a gap between uh, the non world and uh, early Mesoflic occupations. I'd like to finish with by talking about mobility in the wider landscape. In the Fader Mesa, we seem to have people moving the more to sort of finished tools which to me suggests probably quite large scale mobility from travelling quite light and then going to the up pickering as a known source of world scope to the tool. For the longer material, they're carrying really big packages of what look to me very much like exotic uh, material. They don't look like the material you get amongst the uh, early metamorphic sites in the Vale. Um, this may be because people aren't very familiar with this landscape. They don't get that there's a massive great uh, source of food uh, in the Yorkshire wells. Um, they're provisioning themselves. Um, I'm very lucky that uh, I managed to sneak some of the senior stuff in uh, Paul Pettit, um, some of Chan Cherry's and Marcy Watman's um, exciting project um, that we heard about earlier, um, the uh, ICPS um, characteristic of, of the flint sources. Obviously, these are very provisional results, um, but these are sort of mapping as um, these two, uh, including this, which look quite chalky, as um, potentially North Lincolnshire uh, flint source. The others are sort of between um, the uh, East and East Anglian and North Lincolnshire source. Those are the Yorkshire worlds. Nothing seems to be uh, coming, coming from that source of this material. What's quite interesting is um, a lot of the Pasquale material that Paul um, looked at for this project is also coming out here. Um, the, northern, the northern stuff um, that, that we've heard about from the fields of Wayland Farm, for example. So similar sources are perhaps being exploited. Um, massive caveats, though. Uh, Paul's own bunch of chalk sources, and obviously got huge amounts of glacial uh, till, and also um, underwater uh, inundated sources as well. So these are these are very likely to um, be play a part in, in, in people's uh, material procurement. Well, if we take these at face value, you might say that people are moving um, from southern Lincolnshire, and I think it's quite interesting that we have a number of obviously the aerial maps, apologies. There are some major, we saw the major river systems in number of these talks earlier that are heading north. And uh, we saw it in the Devil's talk that again, this sort of focus on the, these rivers with the Cresswellian sites, which use their similar material sources. So you may sort of sort of Cresswellian and Longbank, which sort of 
focus on these sort of more northerly uh, river systems and moving quite broadly. And the Royal Holloway team suggests um, that the sort of fire, the long leg groups may be dealing with much more stable river system, uh, much more navigable river systems than we see in the early Mesolithic when sort of the, the, the western end of the came, they came up from Cork, it's less easy to, to navigate. People are carrying lots of material with the long legs and boats would be one very good way uh, to transport this material. So, so we don't really know very much about um, the long legs occupation for north, but there's some interesting hints about these border systems and connections to these northern rivers and uh, and land. But we definitely need to know about some of these other field sources to be able to understand these, this mobility uh, in detail. <coughs> Thanks very much.